Our next speaker is from Singapore, Professor Tan Ming Po. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Sam and members of the National Innovation Council for the invitation to speak here. Uh, for this session, I'm representing my colleagues from the Ministry of uh, Industry. Uh, maybe first, a little bit of an overview of Singapore. Uh, we are a small country, about 250 square miles in size. Our population uh, currently is about 5.4 million people. Uh, being small, we have our advantage. It's easy to implement government strategies, uh, make changes to the country, social-wise or uh, innovation-wise. But the, the disadvantage is that we have limited uh, human resource to draw upon. Uh, in Singapore, we don't have any primary or natural resources. So human resources is our main uh, driver of innovation. Um, when we gained our independence about 50 years ago, uh, our economy was uh, more or less driven solely by tourism and manufacturing-based uh, activities. Uh, we depended a lot on foreign companies setting up shop in Singapore and uh, producing whatever they need to produce for uh, their overseas market. Uh, but uh, we have made uh, quite a bit of uh, changes since. Uh, prior to 1991, uh, many of our technical know-how and expertise were brought into Singapore through the MNCs uh, by virtue of their training of their local staff in their companies in Singapore, and also through their uh, know-how transfer to our SMEs because they depend on these SMEs for their components and uh, support services. And around that time, the government decided that uh, we need to move up the value chain. And the Singapore government set up the Agency for uh, Science and Technology Research, which is called ASTAR for short. Um, ASTAR's role is to drive public funded uh, R&D in the company, uh, sorry, in the country. Uh, the first five-year plan uh, was funded with a $2 billion uh, budget. We are now into the fifth five-year plan, uh, and it's, it has a budget of uh, $16 billion. Uh, what ASTAR does is um, create uh, research institutes in Singapore because we first need to have that capability to attract foreign investments Singapore by itself is too small to grow uh, either in uh, developing its own industry or uh, uh, companies. So we work very much in collaboration with uh, foreign research institutes as well as with foreign businesses. So in 1991, what the uh, government did was uh, to start up research institutes uh, and from 1991 to now, we have uh, 14 RIs, or research institutes, already established. The initial ones were set up in consultation with MNCs. We get their CEOs, we get their CTOs to work with ASTAR to advise ASTAR on the key areas in which the country has to develop a capability to meet foreign uh, technology demands. Uh, and. Uh, Currently, we have 14 RIs. Seven of these are in the bio uh, bioengineering life sciences domains, and seven are in the physical science uh, engineering domains. And all these uh, RIs, uh, we work very closely with uh, counterparts overseas. Now, in 1991, what happened was that uh, many of the academics from the uh, universities were seconded to the ASTAR. Uh, organizations and some of these have remained there and because of their ties with the universities uh, ASTAR also uh, draws upon universities uh, capabilities as well as uh, facilities. Uh, one of the roles for ASTAR or of ASTAR is to uh, fund Singapore students 
uh, to foreign universities to get their PhDs. Uh, we currently have about 250 PhDs in this scheme. Uh, and these guys, when they come back, they work both in A-star research institutes, and some of them are moving into the universities. Uh, some of these uh, PhDs are also resources for our uh, SMEs. Uh, we have this rent a scientist scheme where companies uh, funded by our economic development board they receive a, a certain amount of funds which they can use as salaries to pay for these uh, PhDs. So PhDs from A-star are seconded to the SMEs and if they like one another the PhDs can after two or three years continue with the SMEs as full-time employees. In other words, the SMEs become the employer of uh, the PhDs and then they get to to assume the responsibility of paying the salary of the, uh, the PhDs. So in this case, we see high-tech capabilities being infused into the local uh, smaller uh, enterprises. Um, and also, ASTAR plays a critical role in attracting foreign uh, partners. For instance, we have a partnership with MITs, with uh, Technion, and uh, some of the IITs uh, in India. And uh, coming back to the SMEs, uh, we have a, also an agency called Spring, which is an uh, entity under the Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry. Uh, Spring is responsible for helping Singapore uh, companies uh, grow and develop a market share in the region. So essentially what Spring does is to uh, develop the Made in Singapore branding, uh, developing trust uh, for Singapore made uh, products. And Spring also works very closely with ASTAR in ensuring that uh, the right technology are being put in place for future generation uh, innovation or product and services uh, that's being developed in the country. So. Um, one of the uh, roles that uh, Spring plays is also working with uh, startup companies or uh, labs, spinning off companies, uh, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that, or uh, labs in the university that are spring, uh, uh, starting an enterprise which st still do not have uh, business uh, acumen. So Spring provides that kind of guidance uh, to this uh, academic-based research uh, developments. And um, one of the success of this kind of uh, investment by the Singapore government on technology development uh, can be seen in three areas. One would be uh, Sabana. Sabana used to be our housing and development board uh, designed agency. They have now uh, spun off and have become a consultancy in uh, township development and urbanization, and they have serving uh, governments in Myanmar and the Southeast Asian region. Uh, Capacol is also another of our homegrown uh, success. They are now the world's largest uh, offshore engineering uh, company, developing uh, off uh, uh, drilling platforms and uh, uh, related work. Uh, in water, uh, we have uh, High Flux, which was again a uh, two man show which is now uh, a million uh, dollar business. And they are also working in the area of uh, clean water and water uh, regeneration uh, in the third world countries. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about our education process and the partnerships that we have uh, with industry in the session tomorrow. And my colleagues here uh, will also be sharing their uh, uh, work uh, in the uh, education area. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We are running short of time. It's already 12 o'clock, so I suggest we speed up a little bit. We still have four or five speakers. 
and it's always a challenge to balance time because there are interesting conversations and I don't want to really cut it off. So our next speaker is from Netherlands, Professor Rosenthal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Petroda, for inviting me here to this important roundtable on innovation. Thank you, of course, for your famous Indian hospitality. Let me do some time compression so uh, I'll be in time indeed. I'm here in my capacity of president of the Dutch Advisory Council for Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. The previous time I was in India, I came here as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of my country and then I was really taken by the vibrant and energetic powerhouses of the Indian economy as well as by the formidable presence of Dutch enterprises here in India, multinationals such as Philips, Royal Dutch Shell, Unilever, DSM and NXP, NXP, but also numerous newcomers, often small and mid-sized businesses. These companies, of course, come here to do business, but increasingly they are here to conduct research and to share innovative practices. As recently as 2006, Royal Dutch Shell established a major technology center in Bangalore. Their center has grown and will soon employ about 1,500 people. Shell and the Netherlands Research Council have launched recently a program worth of 40 million euros to attract about 100 Indian students to do their PhD in computational sciences in the Netherlands and after their PhD, Shell offers them a guaranteed job in Bangalore. Meanwhile, Unilever, Philips and DSM also have substantial R&D centers in India. Let me be clear about it when I'm talking about this matter. No longer, of course, and we all share this, is top-level R&D confined to US and Europe. And would Indian R&D just be there to adapt global products to local markets? These roles are rapidly reversing. Higher education in India is providing global labor markets with a great many young scientists, mathematicians and engineers and the quality of patents from Indian research and development centers does no longer differ from those in, for example, the US or Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the Netherlands are a relatively small country, not as small as Singapore, but relatively small. To be in the top segment of the global rankings on competitiveness does not come by itself. First, we try to have an open mind. We are a country of sailors and traders used to interact and especially learn from others. And uh, second, as a small nation, we cherish international cooperation. We are widely recognized as the gateway to Europe. And third, we try to combine German industrial prowess with British business and competitiveness acumen. We do set priorities, and I would like to stress that. Present Dutch R&D policy mainly aims at two things. Firstly, to, re to really reinforce R&D in the private sector. And secondly, to stimulate the commercial utilization of public knowledge. To achieve these objectives, the Dutch government has adopted a new quite innovative, I would say, approach. It's not so much anymore about policy instruments that focus on generic support and mostly take the form of tax deductions. No, the truly distinctive feature rather is the, new, is the way new R&D policies stimulate genuine cooperation, public-private partnerships and cooperation between businesses on the one hand and universities and research institutes on the other. The coordination of public R&D has been put into the hands of nine public-private industry committees, the so-called top teams, one for the food sector, one for the water sector, etc., etc. You can find them here on the sheet. Big companies, as well as small and mid-sized enterprises, are members of these top teams. Public research institutions and the government are also taking part in the endeavor. So we have a triangle of knowledge institutions, government agencies, and business. 
and each of these top teams have develop, has developed roadmaps and common research agendas. Their commitment is formalized in so-called innovation contracts. And to finance R&D under these contracts, private investments are being matched by public money. And uh, following up on the Israeli presentation, in the top teams, we want the business sector to be in the lead. As a consequence, the Dutch public research institutes and academia are now far more responsive to the needs of industry. And this turns out to be, in turn, a decisive incentive for enterprises to invest indeed much more in R&D in the Netherlands. We see the results over the last few years. Dutch foreign policy is fully aligned with this new approach to innovation policy. It increasingly targets, actually, international cooperation in science and innovation. Every of these nine top teams has prioritized countries to cooperate with, and let me, uh, let me be uh, emphatic about it, seven of the nine top teams have indeed designated India as a pri priority partner, and we are really serious about that. The dialogue between businesses, universities, institutes, the Roy Royal uh, Academy of Sciences, the Research Council, and the government has definitely gained momentum in the last three years. A main topic is how to tackle here the so-called grand challenges. We are confronted with major challenges related to health, food security, water, the bioeconomy, sustainable energy, transport, climate, and, and environment, raw materials, and last but not least, inclusive and secure, secure societies. I'm talking here the grand challenges of the European Union, which the 28 members of the European Union have, have decided upon. Uh, these grand challenges are the main focus of the Horizon 2020, a new 70 billion euro European Union research and innovation program. And these grand challenges, ladies and gentlemen, these grand challenges of today can be seen as the growth markets of tomorrow. And therefore, Dutch innovation policy puts grand challenges center stage. We simply say grand challenges, Dutch solutions. And I would say also Indian solutions, Mr. Pitroda. And Europe and India both face these grand challenges. And for the Netherlands, they are a passage to India. Tackling the grand challenges requires joint R&D efforts in life sciences and health, medical devices, functional materials, infrastructures, water and computer sciences, and all indeed directly pointing to the bottom of the pyramid as well. At present, India and the Netherlands are already cooperating in these domains, and a splendid example is the Indian-Dutch collab collaboration in computer science program. Indian software engineering is world-class, top world-class. Big data, simulation, and serious gaming are, in all modesty, on our part, the Dutch strongholds. And the program is being financed by the Netherlands Research Council. Businesses are strongly encouraged to participate. It's only open to consortia of both academic and, indeed, industrial researchers. It's obvious that research and innovation aimed at grand challenges like water, food, and health are of particular importance for inclusive growth. And the Netherlands is fully committed to contributing to inclusive growth and to fostering innovation at the bottom of the pyramid. So let us grab the opportunities, scale up our efforts. And I'm looking forward to fruitful debates on these issues today and tomorrow. And for our Indian friends, Let's go for it with your cricket phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from Ecuador, Mr. Jamie Medina. Mr. Medina. First, I would like to say thank you for the government of India. Uh, I think we are the, with Brazil the only representative of South America. So we are a small country too. Uh, I would like to say that in order for a society to be considered advanced, it must promote knowledge. That is why the Secretariat of Higher Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation 
and the government greatly support scientific projects. The shift in the productive models has identified 14 productive areas and five strategic industries that will contribute to the transformation of the country. In terms of knowledge and human talent, some areas that are being supported are biotechnology, renewable energies, metallurgic, petrochemicals, and technology. For the Ecuadorian government, achieving this historic challenge is crucial to our future. The shift in the productive model will help the country be a great producer and exporter, taking advantage of the knowledge and human talent. The national plan of the government established some policies and acts to promote research and scientific knowledge, revaluing ancestral knowledge and scientific innovation. Aiming at fortifying the public institutionalism of scientific and science technology and at supporting organizations working on scientific knowledge, production, and technological innovation. Along, technological innova along Ecuador history, we have been exporting raw material and importing finished products made with our raw materials. One example of this is the cacao. We export all our cacao as one of the most, uh, with the biggest quality of the world, but we don't produce chocolate. So, in a small country that since 2006 is investing in master, doctoral, postdoctorate, uh, business professors, in scholarships all over the world, the, net, the next step is to have a structure that will allow us to take advantage of this knowledge. The question is how to use the innovation as a tool for the social change. Our country is investing in people, in human talent. So as an example, I have here one presentation of one of our projects. Uh, here are some data of Ecuador. We can see that we are above the mean of Latin America in the GPD ground in 2011. Uh, in the third place. And our, one of our projects is the city of the knowledge, the Yachay project. It's located in the north of Ecuador, trying to give us some of these innovational ideas, like protection of the biosphere, sustainable use of the natural resource, waste and residual reduction, energy conservation, risk reduction, security of production and service, and environmental restoration. In our development concept that use the four M's, mixed, multiply, masterpiece, and wonderful. In Spanish is the four M's, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> With a functional and a spatial configuration that includes uh, this drift of knowledge, uh, agricultural and biotechnology, this drift of entertainment, and uh, industrial district. As we can see here, we have the triangle that we use in innovation and a metropolitan development. Some goals that we have is the education and research. We are investing in four great universities that could include uh, Yacha University, that is the uh, biotechnological area, Ikean University, the environmental area, and the University of the Arts and the University of Education. All of them include the industry and investigation, and the tourism and culture. We can have the agricultural innovation and the special song for economic development. So we are inviting countries to come to Ecuador and to, we, have, we want to learn how to innovate, how to use our products, for example, Andean chain, Amazon Basin, have all the products that we can use for drugs, for innovation, for biotechnology. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Mr. William Danavers, Deputy Secretary General of OECD. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'll definitely be brief. Uh, this roundtable on inclusive uh, innovation couldn't be more timely. We've done some thinking at the OECD about inclusive growth and innovation, and I would like to share with you some of our ideas. Among the most effective ways of addressing inequalities is better education and skills development. Last month, the OECD released its new survey of adult skills. This is a first-of-its-kind tool that assesses the depth and breadth of countries' talent pools, how well countries use their talent, and what benefits they gain. The survey confirms that inequality in skills is associated with inequality in income. The numbers speak for themselves. On average, across countries, the median hourly wage of workers who get high scores in our literacy test, level four or five, meaning that they can make complex inferences and evaluate subtle arguments in written tasks, texts, is more than 60% higher than the hourly wage of workers who score at level one or below, meaning those who can, at best, read relatively short text and understand basic vocabulary. Those with poor literary literacy skills are also more than twice as likely to be unemployed. Poor skills severely limit the access of people to basic services and to better paying jobs. At the OECD, we are working with countries using the OECD skills strategy, adapting it to the national context and helping them design education and skills policies that will provide people with the skills they need to thrive in the 21st century global jobs market. Innovation is another key pillar of inclusive growth. And we've learned a lot about innovation policies in recent years. Our innovation strategy, released in 2010, urged countries to develop a whole of government strategy aligning ministries, policies, and reforms into, into a coherent nationwide effort to strengthen innovation. Today, we're working with countries around the world to help them strengthen their innovation policies in their own national context. We completed a review of South Af Africa's innovation policies in 2007, China in 2008, and recently completed a review of six Southeast Asian countries. Reviews are currently underway of Colombia, Vietnam, France, and the Netherlands, and others are about to start. In recent years, we've also increased our work on how innovation impacts on inclusive growth. Our current project on knowledge and innovation for inclusive growth is aimed at providing evidence on the impacts of innovation, on inequalities, and at developing policy solutions that, that can help reconcile the innovation and inclusive development agendas. In November last year, we organized an event on this work in South Africa involving participants from China, India, Colombia, Indonesia, and South Africa. And we were pleased to have Professor Maselkar as the uh, keynote speaker for the event. Thank him for that. Our analysis uh, will focus on China, Colombia, India, Indonesia, and South Africa, drawing on other countries' experiences. Inclusive innovation initiatives are particularly interesting, where we have much to learn from India. We will focus notably on the scaling up of inclusive innovation from the local to the national or global markets and what policies can do to help this process. We have also learned that inclusive growth is about putting in place better policies that are pro-growth and pro-inclusiveness at the same time. This is about understanding the trade-offs among policies and how they can be reconciled. It is also about taking into account countries' specific levels of development. Finally, um, finally, we need to get better at measuring inclusive growth and move beyond the narrow focus on GDP growth that has so often characterized the policy debate on growth and development. To make the inclusive growth reform agenda happen, we must continue to refine our policy thinking and to act on it. This roundtable is an excellent opportunity for such reflection and I look forward to hearing from all of you about the initiatives that you are taking to ensure that future growth will be more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Dennis Dubois, 
head of the research and innovation at EU. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. Petroda, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for this invitation. I'll try not to delay your lunch uh, too much. Um, I'm pleased to speak after a number of European Union member states, which I think uh, have demonstrated or have given convincing examples of the strength of the European Union regarding research and innovation. Of course, this is a field in which our member states individually are doing a lot, really a lot. But in addition to that, the European Union as such, uh, and by that I mean in particular the European Commission, is also doing a lot also at a horizon, horizontal level uh, by encouraging member states to join forces and to align their, to align their priorities. Um, the Horizon 2020 program was mentioned uh, by our Dutch colleague. Uh, this is indeed uh, a new program starting next year, uh, which will be, I would say, the largest and most open research and innovation program in the world. Um, the theme of today's conference, affordable and inclusive innovation, is certainly very relevant to most of us, I believe, uh, and to the EU in particular. Uh, as you know, we are going through an economic crisis uh, since quite some time. Uh, this is why a solution can be found, and especially to address uh, the needs of the, I would say, the weakest members of our societies, which are suffering the most uh, from this crisis. Innovation cannot be mandated, but we can try to create the proper framework conditions to promote it. Um, in the EU, we have this Innovation Union flagship initiative. In India, you have this Decade of Innovation uh, initiative. Well, in many parts of the world, there is the same emphasis on, on delivering solutions to problems. And how can we promote innovation? Well, I would see two sets of factors, infrastructures and proper connections. Infrastructures, this is not only about physical labs, schools, universities, uh, ICT networks, etc. This is, all, of course, extremely important. This is also about the regulatory environment for research and innovation, such as uh, intellectual property systems. Uh, and to take just this example, although I could give examples on many of the other issues as well. <coughs> Sorry, uh, on IPR, we have the European Patent Office, we have uh, other unitary IP rights, we have harmonized copyright and many other rights. Well, I think this all goes in the uh, good direction, able to promote innovation if, of course, these regimes are balanced. And, of course, this is a challenge to find the right balance. Uh, so, in addition to infrastructures, which is, if I can say, the piping, we need to have effective connections, which ensure that knowledge will be flowing in this piping. Uh, it must uh, take place at a national level, uh, and many people, many um, speakers have mentioned uh, academia industry relations, uh, for example. This is an area in which the EU has been actively working. Uh, in particular, there was a commission recommendation uh, a few years ago which gave recommendations on how to promote uh, these relations, which are a good example of ensuring that research results get actually translated into concrete solutions to problems. At an international level, of course, uh, something needs to be done. Uh, we are all facing more or less the same global challenges uh, water, health, and many others. Uh, and indeed, as it has been mentioned, they are at the heart of our new program, Horizon 2020. These are so-called societal challenges, which again are most affecting the weakest uh, members of our societies. Uh, since last year, the European Union has a new policy on uh, in international cooperation for research and innovation. I don't have time to enter into the details, but certainly there are many issues going beyond uh, which are at the border of research itself. For example, mobility and visa issues. That is a very relevant question if we talk about international cooperation. Uh, clusters, that is also a tool uh, relevant uh, in, uh, in the innovation sector. And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, the EU organized a conference on clusters in Mumbai. 
there is also an intense collaboration uh, with India in that context, in addition to the many concrete research projects that have already taken place in the past. Public-private partnerships, well, I could name quite a number of uh, other factors, but before concluding, uh, let me stress, this is a personal comment, uh, a need that I see to really promote the use of existing knowledge. Very much and too often in, in my view, uh, we are focusing on current projects, on future projects due to start next year or within, within some time. Uh, but often we are disregarding uh, those projects which have taken place in the past, maybe not in the recent months, but before that, uh, whereas I think that if we, if we conduct some data mining, knowledge mining, whether it is in literature, uh, doctoral theses, uh, patent information, uh, etc., uh, I'm convinced that there is a lot, a lot, a wealth of information there that can still be very relevant for most of us and, again, also for the weakest member of our societies. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I know we are running late, but I have a couple of points I want to make before we break for lunch. One, I want to thank all the speakers for excellent presentations. Some of your PowerPoint slides were really good. I hope we get an opportunity to share those with others. Two, I want to introduce my colleagues here. These are prominent people in India with very interesting background. They are part of the National Innovation Council, so I would encourage our foreign delegates to meet with them individually, collectively, and see if you have anything specific that you want to push. These are the people to work with, along with our young team. So we have Kiran Majmudar. She is a leading businesswoman. Then our colleague Kiran Karnik. He is a business leader, used to be head of the NASCOM, our software industry, for a long time. My colleague here, Saurav Srivatsa, he's an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, head of the Venture Capital Association in India, head of Angel Investment in India. Dr. Garola, he is sort of with the government for a long time, focused on e-governance and all that. Then Dr. Brahmachari, he is the head of the CSIR lab. Dr. Maselkar, our leading scientist, former head of CSIR, you mentioned about him while he was not here. He took a chance since you are not here, he had used your name a little bit in good taste. Thank you. And then Dr. Gupta, he is a professor, activist, a very leading uh, expert in our country on innovations related to bottom of the pyramid. So I encourage you all to sort of interact with them and see whatever specific things that you want to push, you want to work on, they'll be able to help you. One more request. We have a program tomorrow at the President's house, Rashtrapati Bhavan. There are some security needs there. So we have been requested to share your passport details. I want to apologize for the inconvenience, but I think we need that for you to have an entry into this major complex. Finally, I also want to take opportunity to thank my young team. Can you just get up? Please rise. All of these people have been working very hard for the last couple of months. We get all the credit. I'm more like a robot. I come and they tell me what to do and I just do it. And I have to make sure that they are happy, so I do it right. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate all the hard work you put in. Thank you, and let's have great lunch. Thank you. Yeah, I think I know you won't be able to come back at 1 o'clock. Maybe we can delay a little bit, 1.15. Okay.